it's great to see you all here. Thanks for being with us. Welcome to another episode of Leaders Link. I think most of you know me, but for anybody that doesn't, my name's Lindsay Levin. I'm the founder and, and leader of Leaders Quest, and our work is all about helping people align purpose and profit and create and shape a future that works for everybody and for the planet. And in that spirit, I couldn't have two better guests today with me um, than Kim Freeman and Cara Walker Miller. So a huge welcome from two of America's great cities. Kim is from is calling in from the middle of Los Angeles and, and Carla's calling in from the middle of Detroit. So really, really happy to welcome you. Um, just to say a little bit more of context for these particular talks, we've done a series now on racial and social equity with a particular focus on the US. Um, this is the last of this series and the last actually before we take a summer break in Leaders Link. Um, and I'm really thrilled, I think we've had some very rich conversations. Having spent a bit of time with Kim and Carla ahead of this call, I'm really excited about um, what we're gonna learn today and the opportunity to have this discussion with you. So, you know, these are difficult topics, but I hope that our ability to create a safe space and the opportunity to really dive in deep on some of this stuff um, is, is really powerful and useful for people. So I really thank you, Carla and Kim, for joining and for being part of this. I'm just gonna say a tiny bit about each of you. So Carla is the founder and CEO of Walker Miller Energy Services, and her work is all about helping people from all kinds of different households to, to make savings in their energy consumption. So she's kind of at the nexus of how do you reduce your bills make life affordable and save energy and, and reduce your carbon footprint at the same time. Many special things about Carla, but she's built her business from scratch. She now serves people across three states and she has a huge focus on hiring people from diverse backgrounds and building a, a super inclusive culture. And that infuses everything she does. And I think you'll get a sense of that when we hear from her, an engineer by training, and, and now one of Detroit's leading um, CEOs, founders and entrepreneurs, also doing a huge amount to support others and bring other people up behind her, especially female leaders. Kim comes from education. She has spent a lifetime working in education, higher education. She's an expert on, in that space. She's part of the University of Southern California with um, Dawnside College. She serves uh, many roles there, but one of them is as chief diversity officer and part of her experience is around diversity and inclusion and how you think about that across a student body, across faculty, but also with a very strong focus to what does that mean in the community? Um, you know, her, her university sits right in the heart of Los Angeles and the relationship between education and community as well as inclusion and diversity are big focuses for Kim. So thank you both very much for being here. Let me start with you, Carla. Just share a little bit about you, um, about who you are as an entrepreneur and yourself as a leader today in Detroit. Thanks, and thanks for the invitation to be here, Lindsay. I, uh, I, I'm so happy that we're continuing these really, really important discussions. And I, uh, I'm an engineer by trade, as you mentioned, and started in corporate America in the 80s when the world was very different than what it is now. And in an in ener energy engineering type of company. And uh, early on, I realized that I was going to have to spend an inordinate amount of time positioning myself to be seen as a competent engineer, a competent at my craft. But more importantly, I didn't recognize the barrier that that would be because the people who were looking at me were all white men, uh, whether they were uh, from the US or international. Uh, I just didn't have a context for how much of, of the energy of a job uh, it was going to be positioning myself to be seen a certain way. So I was in, I was in uh, engineering in corporate America for 18 years and I had different levels of success. You know, I'm, I was moved from position to position and uh, with more responsibility, but the, the fight, there was always a fight. Uh, to be seen as competent. And that's really what drove me into entrepreneurship. So uh, I am very grateful for my corporate experience. But after 18 years um, in corporate America, I started my own company in the same space, basically selling energy equipment and uh, did that until the recession. 
So after nine years of success, I basically had to start over again because I nearly lost everything. Took a few years of getting out of debt and pivoted to the energy efficiency business, which is the uh, fastest growing segment of the energy business now, of the energy industry. So it really has been a, a blessing to be here in a business that, that is doing well, doing good, uh, so consistent with the mission that this country, one of the many missions this country should be on as far as uh, efficiency and uh, decarbonizing the country, but also investing in industries that grow communities and grow people and, and make the world a better place. So it's, it's a great place to be. Uh, one of my biggest challenges though, is that um, even the energy efficiency industry, there is very little, it's black people, women, people of color are woefully underrepresented. So even though I pivoted my core business, uh, the challenges are just as great to provide on-ramps for people who are not traditionally even considered for this business to be part of it. And to use this business to help uh, empower people and, and enrich uh, communities that are normally left out. Now I know so equity is a huge piece of how you think about your business. And in my experience, having visited with you in Detroit, it's woven into the very fabric of how you think. Uh, you've, oh, absolutely. You've, you've kept everybody on through through this pandemic. You've adapted and flipped and flipped the model as, as, as others have had to do. But give us a couple of examples of what that means in practice. What's it like to work at Walker Miller? Um, give a little bit of a sense of, of how this shows up for people in your business. Well, the, the team at Walker Miller, let me tell you the blessing that they have. And that is that I am a hypersensitive introvert. So one of the reasons I had such a hard time in corporate America is that um, corporate America is big personalities, big moves, major attention, and that's just not who I am. And one of the things I'm most happy about with my company is you don't have to be the 6'2 tall white guy with salt and pepper hair that's in the magazines, right? You can be a 42-year-old shy engineer and still you know, a black female and still be incredibly successful. Um, so we've uh, structured my company. I, I said that when I left corporate America, I was so traumatized that I actually said to God, if you ever allow me to have success, I'm going to value people. And I've set up a company that values people. And we, uh, one of our core values is inclusive stewardship and we recruit everybody and I promise my team, and I say this to them every meeting, that I will never make a decision that's great for the company and bad for my team. I will never make a decision that's great for the company and bad for my team. And they can hold me to that every day. And uh, what I find is that when you invest in people who have been historically marginalized, not only do you create economies and you create communities, you create capacity, you create loyalty, you create a tribe of people who's devoted to telling the story and to giving back and to going back into their communities and bringing something and bringing other people in. So uh, there is no downside to doing the hard work of uh, inclusion and equity. And just one word about diversity, I, you know, starting in the eighties, um, people would, kind of snark even when they said the word diversity. Diversity is a disservice if you bring people into an organization and you don't respect them, you don't recognize or acknowledge their differences, their needs, their cultures, and you just can call yourself diverse because you have bodies there that look different. Diversity in the 80s for many people was very harmful, it was traumatic because there was no inclusion and there was no equity. And that's what we have to be different. That's what we have to do differently. Fabulous, Carla, thank you so much. Now I wanna bring Kim into this. So Kim, you know, there you are, part of the city, nexus of education and, and community. Share, share a little bit of your story and, and just what really matters most to you. Let's get a sense of your values and what drives the work you're doing. Well, thank you, Lindsay, and thank you, Carla. Um, our trajectories in um, our careers are very similar. I started out as an engineer as well in an energy company. 
Um, I started out in the local utility here in Los Angeles working as an environmental engineer and then decided very quickly that I was interested in the human side of the enterprise. So I left engineering after about four years and started working in regulatory affairs and marketing and in other areas of the company where I could really touch the customer in a way that was a little bit um, harder to do in an engineering function. And I, I really love the customer service aspect of the local utility. I felt um, a part of not only the company, but I felt a part of the community that we served. Um, so much so that I, uh, when I left the company, was the director of community relations. Um, really a, a fantastic job that I had for about 12 years, getting to do corporate philanthropy. It's um, where I worked with, you know, local NGOs that were doing some uh, really important work around economic development and education and um, working within, you know, quality of life space for many of our um, most vulnerable and, and marginalized residents in the LA area. So I enjoyed that work so much and, and I felt, you know, it was kind of a natural time for me to leave when I did because I wasn't um, at a place where I could do more of that. I was um, really doing it, but I wanted to do even more. So I thought higher ed would be a really interesting place to pivot my career. And so about seven years ago, I left the energy space to work in higher education. And I saw so many similarities, heavily regulated, you know, customer interface with the public, um, the knowledge content, um, having, having a lot of knowledge workers. And I was in a business school setting, which to me was the best bridge between working in the corporate sector and moving into higher education. Um, and then about two years ago, I was recruited away from our crosstown rival UCLA to work at uh, the University of Southern California. And I said, absolutely, this is, um, my time is now because I am a native Angelino. I love working in the community. USC is situated in one of the most vibrant, uh, ethnically diverse parts of our city. It's just a wonderful place to, um, when we can, drive to work and interact with residents, um, you know, that are located in what we call South LA. It's the heart of Los Angeles, I believe. And so I was really excited about the opportunity to do diversity and inclusion work in that setting. Uh, what I've come to know in the last two and a half years of being at the University of Southern California is that um, yes, the diversity, equity, and inclusion space is, is a really important space to be in, but it's one that I really want to work my way out of. I think the um, thing that keeps me up at night is the fact that we have this proliferation of people with chief diversity officer roles um, because we haven't gotten the model right. We haven't figured out the secret sauce. We're still struggling with a lot of the same things that people have struggled with in corporate America and higher ed in all sectors of society, you know, almost since the beginning of time, but certainly in the last 50 or 60 years. So um, I'm a problem solver as an engineer by nature, and I really just want to roll up my sleeves and figure out what we can do to make things more functional and um, acceptable for people of all Fabulous. kinds. Fabulous, Kim. I, I know a lot of the people who've, who've tuned in today have done so because this is a deeply thoughtful but I'm looking at so many women on the screen, isn't this interesting? Deeply thoughtful um, group of people who are really wanting to pay attention to how we do this stuff well. Um, and, and I think for all of us, oh, there's one, David's just popped in as a, as a male face. <laughs> Thank you, David. Um, people turning their cameras on. So women who put their cameras on um, is, is wanting to do this stuff well, but also being prepared to make mistakes inevitably and to learn from those and sometimes feel awkward and embarrassed about how to get this stuff right. I just wonder, Kim, give us two or three pieces of guidance for people who want to unpeel the layers and, and really do a better job on what it means to be part of, of, of this society, whichever society we're in. Well, I was just reading something earlier in a leadership magazine about perspective giving versus perspective taking. And it was really intriguing because I do a lot of perspective taking. 
I think being in a position that is functionally about um, helping organizations to achieve diversity, equity, and inclusion, I do have um, power and authority over this particular issue. But I think where we all are now is in the uh, space, this you know, space in between or uh, liminal space that uh, is being written about where we need to do more perspective giving and um, kind of hand over the microphone to the people who have not had a voice. Um, we see that in the protests that are happening all around the country, all around the world, that uh, these marginalized voices need to be amplified. They need to be boosted. So I think for those of us who um, kind of sit in places of privilege or um, you know feel that we have more uh, of power, more power and authority in our organizations, we need to be humble. Um, we need to remain curious and, and we need to actual, actually allow for failure to be present. Um, I think I'm in an environment where failure is not really a prized uh, attribute. You know, you have some of the most brilliant minds and brilliant thinkers and they have really not had um, to struggle with anything in their, like you struggle with anything of this magnitude in their right. profession career so I just think um, giving people permission to not be good in the in this moment at conversations at um, ideas and solutions that you know may not stick in the short run but may have potential to, to work in the long run if we keep working at them so I'm I'm in the space of wanting to give people more grace and asking them to just uh, give it to me too fabulous Thank you, Kim. Thank you. Carla, when we spoke a couple of days back, you said to me, I'm refusing to it right now to talk about easy solutions to difficult problems. And another thing you said was race is kind of everywhere and everything. I'd love you to just build a little bit on, on what Kim just shared and, and talk about difficult solutions, perhaps to difficult problems. Yeah, I, I really appreciate Kim's um, comments about grace because it's a word I've used so much, so very much. We have to allow us all to make mistakes. And um, I, I think about uh, a couple of things. I started really understanding gender identity issues when my niece, who is now in her early 20s, my lovely niece, became my incredible nephew. Before that, I did not even have the interest, right? I didn't have a driver. I learned about the prison reform system when I had people that I cared about who had to navigate the ugliness of it. We cannot wait until we have personal experiences to drive us to address things that people are struggling with every day. We absolutely have to delve in and be the problem solvers that we naturally are when things affect us personally because then we solve problems because we have no choice but what would the world be like if we saw problems and we worked to solve them before they affected us personally so i do want everyone to just lean in and take some risks and be courageous and make some mistakes and have to be corrected even even and by the same token, I was on a conversation this morning with a colleague of mine who believes everything I believe. And uh, we have a white colleague who put something in writing that neither of us agrees with. And I said the same thing to her. He is advancing the mission. He's not doing it the way we would do it. He's not using the language that we would use. But we have to meet in, in social services. We talk about meeting people where they are all the time. And in this issue, we have to meet people where they are so that we can bring them. It's a journey. We have to walk people to where they need to be, to be better than they are right now and not expect gigantic leaps. Sometimes small steps are better than huge leaps. And we're, you know, I feel like we're all so traumatized right now that we can't compare you know, my trauma is worse than your trauma, my pain, because I've been here. And I also have a friend who is, uh, this is complicated, but she's so angry that now the racial justice is involved. And she wants to know, where were you when I was in the fight alone? 
And my position is, okay, you weren't there. I'm not going to ask where you were then. I am going to start with now that you are here, what can we do together? I am not going to judge where you were. I, if I think about it, I can get angry too of, of, of the rooms that I've been in and the struggle that I've been in along. But what was that compared to John Lewis's struggle or the struggles of our forefathers? We cannot compare our struggles. But everyone on this call, now that you're here, what can we do together? And I'm so excited about that. And I don't remember the question, Lindsay. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, that's beautiful. That's beautiful. So, Kim, now that we're here, what, what can we do about it? Love you to build on that. Uh, well, yeah. I'm sorry. You're Go there. Ahead, Kim. Go, Kim. Yes, Kim. Uh, yes. Okay. And I, I think, you know, Carla is right to point out um, it should not, or, you know, some of us um, probably think it should not have taken the events of Memorial Day or even, um, you know, earlier in the year with Ahmaud Aubrey and Breonna Taylor, but certainly when we all saw the video of George Floyd, it should not have prompted us to um, action because these things have been happening for many years. I saw some memes on social media about um, people who said they're still crying for Emmett Till, you know. Um. I, I think about my grandmother who visited the um, museum in Washington, D.C., um, the Museum of African American History, and I was with her, and how um, touching it was for her to go into the exhibit where Emmett Till's coffin is displayed. You know, anyone who was alive during that time and, and understood the horrors of that uh, tragedy would have some kind of visceral reaction, I'm sure, to see the uh, coffin. And so to me, um, I am like Carla, it's like, well, you know, I'm going to just embrace the fact that you're here now um, mm -hmm. and not spend too much time fretting over the fact that you just got here. Um, mm -hmm. But I think what we need to do is stop admiring problems. Um, we have all these reading lists that are going around and my colleagues at work know I rant about this sometimes. It's like um, we can't read our way out of this. I mean it's important for us to level set and to use language that is um, understood by everyone so that we can have really thoughtful conver conversations and, and engage with this material. But really we have to do what um, and. Uh, Carla mentioned the late Congressman John Lewis, we have to get into good trouble. I mean, when we see injustice, we have to call it out. We have to um, tell people what is wrong so that we can begin to do what is right. And I don't think um, we have had to challenge ourselves in that way because we've all um, in our own ways been living with privilege and living with the ability to um, think that it's somebody else's problem and not our problem. But what the pandemic is uh, forcing us to do is recognize that we are not going to get out of this, the pandemic and the protest, um, mm -hmm. and quite frankly, in the United States, our current political crisis, we're not going to get out of these things unless we work together. I mean, it's one team, one goal, really, it is. Fabulous. I'd love to bring in other voices now. So please, um, if you're on screen, feel free to just wave your hand. We'd love to hear some questions from people. You can also go into the participants section and do the raised hand if you'd like to. Uh, but would really welcome some questions and comments. Who wants to be brave and speak up first? Max, raising your glasses will get you into to being called upon. I can say something. Thank you, Sofna. Yeah, great. We'd love to hear from you. <laughs> yeah, you know, I've dedicated two decades for these issues. Um, just finished my PhD on that. It's very challenging. I'm ex I, I live in a community now, um, and. Um, you just said, um, you know, um, when we see injustice, we have to call it out. Like we should not see it as someone else's problem. You know, it's very challenging to do it in a reality because people like to, uh, they, they'll go far um, to feel belong, belonging. And when something happens, 
um, they take the loud voice, you know, the, 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 the powerful, powerful people at the moment. And um, it's really hard to stand out, but we do rely on the mass, on the many people that um, go for the truth, for the values that we, that we appreciate. Um, and it's not an individual task. We have to remember that. You know, sometimes um, we say to women, especially, you have to be strong, you have to be assertive. We are looking at it from an individual point of view, but it's not the work for the individual only. It's the work of all of us. These biases are so ingrained in our society that it, it takes our effort as a community. So um, it, it's really hard. And another thing that I wanted to say, I think the change comes from two dimensions. One is making a shift in how we see things. That's one thing, working on our mindset. And another thing, and you spoke about that, another thing that I think we overlook is to change the structure and the actions and the practices in our organization to allow to sustain that shift. I, I have been, I am intentionally joining those discussions now um, for the last few months, and I don't see much conversation about the practices and how we can sustain that change. If we don't pay attention to the structures and the practices, it's going to end up in a nice website or statement on the wall or a vision but not real, real a change in behavior. So that's my main piece. Thank you, Sofla. Sofla does amazing work on women, women wage peace. You're partly referring to, I think, Sofna, as well as, as well as your research. Yeah, give us a sentence on what you're covering here. Thank you, thank you. Other people, comments or questions? Daria. Yeah. It, it, this has been such a wonderful conversation and in no way am I surprised by that, but I, I, it, there's, there's something about across so many of these wicked challenges that our society has created for itself or ignored for a really long time, this real humbling lesson about urgency and patience. And, and I'd love to hear just in, in, you know, I was thinking in reading about John Lewis as a sort of embodiment of urgency and patience and how this moment really calls for that and requires it. And I'd love just sort of what your insights are about the things that are urgent. What are the things in your experience for lessons for us about what's urgent and where we should give ourselves the grace to have patience and how to balance the two? Wonderful. Who wants to take a first go at that? Balancing urgency and patience, Kim or Carla? Uh, yeah, I'll start. Uh, I think it's really complicated because it, it is going to be driven by your lived experience, uh, by your personal tolerance for, for everything. Um, my daughter and I were having a conversation because there's a, a sense with a lot of young people that they're, and, and me too, that the urgency is now. I feel that we have a window uh, where people are really open to making a change. And it's so important that we push through right now. Uh, by the same token, in our individual lives, we have to be reasonable about what choosing the wrong fight means to us personally. You know, I tell people all the time, I have crafted the art of saying what needs to be said and still continue to live in a house because you have to pick your battles. If you say the wrong thing or the right thing to the wrong person at the wrong time, you have to always, we're smart people, we have to be aware of the ramifications. So you really do have to look at your personal tolerance to say what needs to be said and when it needs to be said, and even who needs to say it. One of the reasons I'm so happy that white men are engaged right now is that they're in rooms where they can make a difference in policies, where they're making decisions every day where you know, uh, uh, the privileged make decisions that disproportionately impact people who are not privileged, and we don't even know that those decisions were made until they 
actually hit us in the face. So uh, it's not just urgency versus patience. Uh, when um, Lindsay asked earlier about my um, uh, refusal to say simple solutions to complicated things, this is one of the thousands of complicated things where there are big perspectives, but there's also your individual perspective. You can't make a decision that's great for the movement and terrible for your family, right? So you really have to think about what needs to be said, when, who needs to say it, and how. Wonderful. One of all the responsibility. Wonderful. Nina, Nina, you've posted a question in the chat, which I'm going to invite Kim to respond to. Um, and I think I know I can I can echo your question. I think a lot of people can. So really wanting to step up and having some fear about what I can and cannot say as a white woman and how I'll be perceived in terms of my own privilege. So this sort of awkwardness of stepping in and fearing getting things wrong. Could you, could you speak maybe quite practically, Kim, um, in response to that question? Um, I, I would say the practical side of it is, as a black woman, I've had to speak up many <laughs> times and have the same issue. Um, you know, without the um, current, you know, kind of discourse around white fragility or this um, wanting to make things safe and brave and you know every every space i've been in has had some element of threat or danger if you will um because uh when you operate in spaces that are you know majority white or um predominantly white institution like i am you are going to find yourself in rooms where you're the only the lonely only as i have said to my a former boss, and he liked that term. Um, <laughs> he thought it was funny. Um, but the bottom line is, I think you do it anyway, you know, because courage is in short supply right now. And if you don't develop your muscle of courage, when are you going to um, take that difficult stance or um, perhaps, you know, say something that you may uh, not say as ele elegant or eloquently? Um, as I'm trying to do right now, which is difficult on Zoom. Um, but you know, you may have those moments where you stumble, you may have those moments where you wanna take those words back, you know, just as quickly as they've tumbled out of your mouth. But I think, you know, everybody is in that boat. I know I for, for sure have been in that boat and I haven't had the luxury of trying to find, you know, the perfect way of saying something. Wonderful. And if I just can uh, add yeah. to that, Lindsay, um, so I try to be courageous. I, I pray every room I'm in, I literally pray that God will give me the courage to say what I need to say. But I have also, I also allow myself grace. And a couple of years ago, I started saying to myself, courage is a renewable resource. If I want to speak up and for some reason in that room at that moment, for whatever reason, I don't. The next room is still an opportunity. So don't beat yourself up because we're human. We have these hearts and these spirits that are trying to punch through a lot of different things. So I agree totally with Kim. I've been in rooms where my voice quaked. I was so intimidated by what I needed to say. But I've also been in rooms where I didn't really say, I kind of skirted around what I was really trying to say, right? We all do that depending on the room. Give yourself a break, be courageous. But don't knock yourself when you're not courageous because uh, you'll live to fight another day. Just stay in the fight. Mel Katzman, you've posted a question. I'd love you to ask the question, but I'd also love you to share at least one answer to it because you think deeply about this stuff. So um, Melanie, please come off, ask your question, but give us an action too. You're very good at this. So um, First of all, thank you so much. I really appreciate this conversation and the contextualization that both Carla and Kim gave of your own experience. And it inspires me to think about what my actions are, um, not only what they have been, but what they can be. And so my question is really, what are three actions that each of us can take immediately? You know, I tend to get down to the practical and want to know what is it that I can do now and what is it that we can do now? You know, one of the things that I try really hard to do is to make sure I see everybody that is in a room and I know what their name is. 
um, not the name that's easy for me to pronounce, but the name that they go by, that they resonate to, and to make sure that there's a name, eye contact, and a recognition of everybody so that people are not invisible. So that would be one of my specifics, um, Lindsay, and thank you for asking. And I'm really interested in what Carla and Kim would tell us so that we are sure to leave here acting differently. Well, I'll start on that one. Um, and it reminds me of a couple of things. First of all, it reminds me of the John Wooden quote, be quick, but don't hurry. And I think that um, we have to be quick, but don't hurry to get to the action steps. Because um, what someone said recently in a conversation I was in at work is that we need to allow people to um, just really get their um, feelings and expressions out on the table. I think if we um, don't take the time to really be in deep conversation and dialogue, and we try to move too quickly to actionable things, then we are not hearing the stories of the unheard. And that translates to a lot of the unrest that we see because we continue to suppress those stories. So in my opinion, doing nothing or, you know, sitting in this liminal space, I would say, um, is doing something. Um, so I would say that's the first thing. But the second thing is really something I said earlier, which is to be humble. This cultural humility can't be um, understated. Right now is a time of tremendous upheaval and people really need to believe that their cultural identities are respected. So I would say um, be humble, you know, really just um, stay in a space where you allow for other people to maybe speak their stories into the room and, and have a chance to feel like they're on equal footing. And then the last thing is shadow of a leader. I mean, we're all leaders in our organizations. People watch what we do. So, you know, watch your words, watch your um, activities and your actions and the things that you do on a daily basis. Because those little things, those, you know, small activities that you do, they add up to something material. And so um, you've got to develop, I would say, a diversity presence. You know, if there was a um, leadership attribute that people were um, being judged on, it's a presence around these issues that gives you some credibility, you know, so maybe in your free time, which I don't know how many of us have that anymore when we're working and living in our homes right now, but, you know, pick up that book read those uh, things that are being released. There are big thinkers who are producing books around this, not, not only right now, but there's lots of books that have been written, you know, for the last century. And I have been just trying to read and consume as much as I can, and then put that through the process of what's going on today, how it shows up in my life in higher education, and really to lead by example, you know, showing the people that report to me and the people that I influence, how this stuff is important and it is fundamental to our existence. So for me, it's about leadership, it's about cultural humility, and it's about respecting the fact that some people need this cathartic moment and we need to give it to them. So I, I love your comments, Kim, and I am going to start where you left off, which really is reading and educating yourself. There's an African proverb that I've used a lot lately and it says, until the lion learns to write, the history will always uh, glorify the hunter. Until the lion learns to write, the history will always glorify the hunter. And in the United States, and I'm sure for other countries, we have learned the history written by the hunter. We don't know our history. We don't know uh, where black people really fit our, why we are where we are. And there's so much that has been written over the last several hundred years. And this is really a, a renaissance of, um, of reading, of literature, and of an opportunity to educate yourself to the real history of America. Because white men wrote the books, even the books that we read, even the books that we were all educated from. And the books said that we had a few lines you know, in slavery, and then a few lines in when, when Black people were freed, and that was basically it. And what, if that's true, then that means that the reason we are where we are is because we all made Black people 
just over hundreds of years have made poor personal choices and we just aren't as smart as white people. That's what you would just come to believe if you were educated by the school system in the United States. And it's so much deeper and richer than that. Our histories have been written and they're only starting to be read so that people understand our realities. It's going to be much easier to have a different perspective if you really understood that in the United States, laws were changed to accommodate, continuing to keep black people disenfranchised. And one of the things I've said that I absolutely believe is true is that after slavery, black people went from being an asset to the economy to a problem. And our country has treated us as a problem ever since. And if you read the history, that is what you will learn. And it will open your perspective. It will allow you to say, okay, maybe I've been looking at this differently. So I, I feel like we have to have a foundation that will help move us to a point where we really can see equity as an imperative and not just a giveaway to Black people. Kieran Carney, you've been so thoughtful. This is such a rich and generous um, and powerful conversation. Uh, really wonderful. I wonder, and, and by the way, Matan Jaffrey, I see you've posted a great question, particularly relevant to Kim. So I'm going to put you to an email touch afterwards. I want you to know, I know you're not on video, but I want you to know I've caught your question. Just to end, uh, you, you've been super kind, um, Kim and Car Carla. It'd be lovely to just finish with something that maybe you're personally hoping or focused on in terms of your own work life mission right now as, as you each look at look at that what what are you hoping what's something you're striving for right now that feels important to you personally so one of the things that's important to me is sharing my personal story because people look at me as a ceo and they say that my experience is different I like to tell people the time that I went to the emergency room at 3 a.m. in the wee hours of the night, and I left there in pain because the doctors decided that I was exhibiting drug-seeking behavior. So the healthcare system failed me, even though I had good insurance and a good job. I want to make the story so that you don't think that only marginalized people, only people who live in certain areas and zip codes have these experiences. I want to allow people to understand that walking in a black body has its own ramifications because again it normalizes the steps that we need to take to achieve equity that's a personal mission for me thank you carla and what about you kim well it's um exciting that i work in higher education right now um because i have always believed in the promise of education um this phrase education is the great equalizer is something that i would say all the time and i have seen it um, manifest in my own life in terms of the things that i've been able to accomplish privately um, and you know on behalf of my family However, um, I am troubled by what's happening in higher education right now as it relates to underrepresented minoritized students um, here, um, specifically in California. And so I'm really on a mission to um, do what I can to make the learning journey for our underrepresented minority students in higher education at schools like the University of Southern California and others uh, to make that what it should be, um, to make it live up to its promise because students are expending not only their uh, time, but they're expending a lot of their financial resources and then to um, be experiencing the hurt and harm that many of them are now you know, expressing as a result of um, this pandemic and the political protest, I think it requires me to be a lot more intentional in my work to look at ways that I can, can make it better. And if I can make it better, at least for the students who are in the liberal arts area of the campus um, within the college that I am responsible for, then that you know, will make me feel really good. 
Thank you both very much. Thank you for your wisdom. Thank you for your grace. I think it's certainly two of the most graceful in every sense of the words guests um, that have joined us. This has been such a special conversation. I can see from the messages that, that people are, are pouring in here that this has really meant a lot to people. So I thank you both very much. Um, I wish you a great rest of the summer. I um, look forward to working with both of you going forward. Thank you everybody for joining. Um, wonderful to see so many so many people here and we look forward to resuming with you on leaders link in september watch out for the for the males talking about who'll be coming up 